Two days ago, just outside Lansing, Michigan, a Hawker 800 XP gets involved in an incident, a stall and a stall recovery, and it does not go well for the crew. Let's listen in. Okay, the main player here is X-Ray Alpha Juliet Mike Romeo. It's a uh, Hawker 800 XP, and it's uh, registered. It's a Mexican registration of this airplane to a uh, airline, Aerolineus del Centro. It was involved in this freak accident. We know what happened, but we don't know how it happened. And we know what happened because the pilots tell us. Listen. Aircraft Juliet Mike Romeo Cleveland Center. I'm not sure if it's one six. Everything's pretty normal so far. Getting the altimeter setting, climbing up to altitude. Where are they going? I'll tell you in a minute. He calls and says, Cleveland. Air traffic, Juliet Mike Romeo, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, just for request a uh, work area for blood something. It's one five up. Uh, you're just requesting a place to fly around for at one five thousand. Okay, so it's a, he's a little difficult to understand. Part of it is the radios are really scratchy. Now, you've heard a lot of radio transmissions on this channel, and sometimes they're real scratchy. This aircraft, and there's something important to know about this aircraft, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, I think it's a problem with the airplane, the scratchiness of the radios. Then there's the language barrier. Now, you've heard me talk about how English is the international language of aviation, and you have to be English proficient to get a pilot's license to fly anywhere in the world. But that English proficiency doesn't mean conversational English like you and I would understand it or like we're having right now. It's basically proficient at aviation English. So anything that's kind of out of the ordinary is kind of difficult to communicate. So I feel I feel sorry for these guys. It's hard to, in a second language, try to communicate uh, to an air traffic controller exactly what you want. Uh, but I'll interpret for you in a minute what these guys are asking for because the controller keeps kind of asking. This guy's really patient. He's a good controller. Aircraft Juliet Mike Romeo, flighting zero three zero. All right, he sends him on a vector. Aircraft Juliet Mike Romeo, do you just need an area to fly around to uh, get some work done? So he asked him a question. Do you need to get some work done? Yeah, uh, flight uh, 15,000, but uh, for the area of flight. Okay, so his radio keeps kind of cutting out. It, it gets real faint a little bit. What he said was this, uh, and you heard a second voice come in. So that's generally speaking, the captain or it could be the instructor uh, is just chiming in and saying, We're, we need a area to work in at one four thousand maybe to one five thousand we need a thousand foot of altitude to work in and i and i want to do it in a 10 mile radius around a midpoint uh, and so he could create a point right there on the ground generally speaking you're going to ask for a radial and dme off of a set already known point what he's asking for here is a working area or a block altitude that's actually what he needs to say block altitude now Airliners don't ask for block altitudes. We get a set altitude and we fly there. Whenever we go someplace, we fly at that altitude. When you're going out on a training mission, I did this a lot of times in the military, you would ask for a block altitude so you could climb and descend without having to ask every time to do that because you might be doing some maneuvers that require a climb or a descent. These guys are about to do a maneuver here, it looks like, that's going to get them in a rapid descent that they can't get out of. And that's the problem with this one. But they're asking for a block altitude. They're doing it in a second language. There's a little bit of a language barrier. They're going to finally work their way through that. So listen to what the controller says to them next. Hey, Jeff, it's Jill and Mike Remy. You're coming in pretty broken and exactly what you need. Say it again. Say it again. All right. He's patient. We need an area of... Eight miles around. Uh, we need an area of ten miles for now. He says. All of the time, one thousand. But we could, uh, we could climb one thousand or, the, or or descend one thousand from altitude. <laughs> so he's. This is a really wordy description of what he wants to do. It's a place where we could climb a thousand or descend a thousand. He's asking for a block altitude between fourteen and sixteen thousand. All right, and he wants to have that little 
piece of pie so he can do his maneuvers. Now, what is he doing out here? All right. That's a, that's the next question. At first, when I first uh, listened to this, I thought, oh, he's on a training flight. He's got a student and you're going to do some stuff with a student and you need a couple of thousand feet to, to do your climbs and descents. That's not what's going on here. This airplane, this particular Hawker has not flown since March. So it's been out of commission for six, almost seven months now. And the assumption now, this is just an assumption on my part. The assumption would be that it's been undergoing some sort of maintenance. There's no reason that a Mexican register registered Hawker jet to an airline would be um, sitting in Battle Creek, Michigan for six months, just not doing anything. So they were probably getting some sort of maintenance done on it. Once they get it fixed, depending on how extensive that maintenance is, that airplane is going to have to go up for what's called a functional check flight. Now, there's all sorts of different names for a functional check flight. But when I was in the Navy, that's what we called it, a functional check flight. I've been on many of them over the years where you take an airplane that's just coming out of maintenance Sometimes you have a real long four, five, six pages of things you have to put that airplane through to get its airworthiness certificate back. Typically speaking, you'll have a specially qualified functional check pilot that will go out and do that. I don't know the first thing about either one, or there's actually three people on this airplane, any of them, uh, whether they were functional check pilots or not. That's not, it's actually irrelevant to the story. Um, what happens here next is um, shocking and, uh, You'll see. Hi, right, Jeff. Joe, Mike Remy. I think both of you are stepping on each other, and it's coming in pretty broken here. So one at a time, uh, what do you need? Yes, sir. Uh, this, uh, oh, did you hear me? Hi, right, Jeff. Joe, Mike Remy. I hear you uh, loud and clear now, so try it again. Okay, sir. Uh, just for request, a work area uh, and uh, 15,000, and between the... 2000 and plus left uh, for work area. So it's like the third way he's describing it. Right, Jeff, Jeff, you need a work area at 15,000, and are you going to be going plus and minus altitude? Is that what you're trying to yep. say or yep. no? Yep. Yes, like sir. Between, between 14 and 15, uh, 16,000 area. All right, Jeff, you Julia, Mike, Romeo, fighting 360. Like it in 360, I'll put you the bar. So he's going to send him up to the north. Extra, Julia, Mike, Romeo, maintain block one four thousand through one six thousand. Okay, so finally, uh, ATC gets it, and he says, "You've got a block altitude. You're clear between fourteen and sixteen thousand. You don't have to call me when you climb up and down in that area. You can do whatever you want in that altitude. So that's his block altitude. That's what the air traffic controller is looking at. That's what he's assigned to him on his screen. If he deviates from that significantly, he's going to get a big red warning on his screen. Hold on." Okay, one for the one Mike Romeo. Do you need anything else? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very no much. No problem. Let me know if you do. Now, is this guy required to tell him he's doing a functional check flight? No, he's just asking for a block altitude, and he's going to go out and fly around now, and presumably go through his checklist. It might take quite a while. Um, it's 5.30 in the afternoon in Michigan at this time, uh, and uh, the sun's going to go down probably within the next hour. I think that has something to do with this. I'll explain why in a minute. So here he is now. He's out in his operating area. And I think he's probably starting his first maneuver. Okay. And you hear this. He speaks it in okay. Spanish. He's keyed up the mic in Spanish. The translation is now go down. Okay. So something is something has begun to happen. I'm gonna let it all play out because it's pretty dramatic and it's kind of hard to listen to. So follow me. Um. You see the red on the screen now? His altitude. He's dropping at twelve thousand foot per minute. The pilot's about to tell us Extra what's going Julia, on. Julia, Mike, Romeo, Cleveland. First call. We are in it. We're in it, he says. Stall recovery, sir. Stall recovery, sorry. Okay, stall recovery, stall recovery, sorry, he says. That's the last we're going to hear from these guys. Extra for Julia, Mike, Romeo, Cleveland, center, stay altitude. They're at 6,000, 5,000. Extra for Julia, Mike, Romeo, Cleveland, 4, center. 4,000, 3,000. Extra Alpha Julia Mike Romeo Cleveland Center. How do you read? 2,000 feet. Extra Alpha Julia Mike Romeo Cleveland Center. Extra Alpha Julia Mike Romeo Cleveland Center. 
Southwest 3149, uh, can you look at your 1 o'clock and about 2 zero miles? We're looking for an aircraft. Do you see if you see anything out there on the ground? We're looking on the ground, Southwest 3149. Yeah. Southwest calls back and says, we're looking on the ground. Wow. Um, this is the little twist at the end here of this where they asked for help from Southwest. And, um, yeah, I can't imagine being asked to start looking on the ground to see if you see if there's an airplane that's crashed, but Southwest helps out here a lot. Yeah, well, I think we would uh, crash in, uh, yeah, just look and see if you see anything out there, any smoke or anything like that for me, please, we're lost. Uh, we're looking, nothing to right now, but we'll stop. Thanks, we uh, just lost them on radar and can't get a hold of them right now, so let me know what you can see. Yeah, we got a uh, burning smoke almost at our one o'clock wall down low. There's a picture of what took place, and it's just off the interstate here. Um, nobody on the ground was hurt. All three pilots were fatally injured. Southwest keeps reporting. Here we go. Southwest 3149, that's you that has that. Hey, for 2149. Looks like there's a road just to the south is where they're uh, where that smoke's coming out from. You see a road out that way, uh, is what you're saying? Firm. There's a, it looks like a highway just to the uh, south, uh, southeast, maybe, uh, I don't know, a half a mile or so from where the burning smoke is. There's a road to the south, southeast from where the burning smoke is. Yeah, firm. It's a uh, big old black smoke coming up. Okay. All three on board were killed. Now, here's what I think happened, and the pilots told us. Uh, they had the presence of mind, now think about this, in a second language to key up the mic and say, we're stalling, we're stalling, sorry. And they were in a stall recovery, uh, either the instructor or the student or the other co-pilot keyed the mic and, and told us that little bit of information. We don't know how they got into the stall. All we know was that they were in a stall. And when you see the altitude plummet like that, the, the air traffic controller screen is going to go bright red right above that aircraft and then he's going to get an altitude warning and he's watching that altitude descend rapidly that's a classic stall um, scenario that's why he calls i think what four or five times and, and says acknowledge acknowledge you know call he's you know he calls him but um at one point they've they've already impacted the ground um, and they're too busy trying to recover from a stall. So how do you recover from a stall, all right? Um, and what does it mean for an aircraft to stall? Well, it doesn't, it's not like your car stalling. And when your car stalls, it means the engine just stops. That's not necessarily what happened here. You can have both engines running just fine, and an aircraft can still stall. That's when the air gets disrupted over the wings, and it loses lift, either on one or both of the wings. And so typically, you're going to lose lift on one wing before the other. And I practiced stalls uh, in a real airplane back in the Navy days, in my primary training days, in a T-34 Charlie, little single-engine turboprop. I loved that airplane. Uh, but we would go up to altitude, and you'd ask for a block altitude of about 4,000 feet to practice your stalls. You'd go up to the top of that block altitude. You'd pull back on the stick. You'd pull back on the power to induce a stall, and you just hold the nose of the airplane up until the airplane lost lift. At that point, one or the other wing is going to fall through, and when it falls through, the nose is going to drop through. When it, the nose drops through, the airplane begins to twist and it begins to spin. Here's how you get out of a stall. You ha it's counterintuitive. It, it doesn't. At first, you, you don't want to let go of the stick or the yoke that's in front of you. You want to hold on to it for all you're worth. You have to let go. You have to neutralize the controls and just let go. And then whatever direction you're spinning in, let's say you're spinning to the right, you're going to apply left rudder. Now, you're not going to slam on that left rudder. You're going to apply it smoothly but firmly all the way to the other detent. At that point, because you don't want to break the, the rudder off the aircraft. You're going to apply smoothly. At that point, the, the spinning is going to slow down. And once you arrest the spin, then you have to go back to the yoke or back to your stick and pull up gently. All right. And make sure that you're paying attention to your airspeed because it's really going to be screaming at that point. And you don't want to over G the airplane, but you want to pull out smoothly with both wings. You don't want to pull out in a big turn one way or another. So again, all that stuff needs to get done kind of quickly, not in a panic, but you have to know what to do. 
I don't know if these guys were functional check flight pilot trained uh, in any of those aerobatic uh, sort of things. It's not something you can really practice in a simulator. You can practice approaches to stalls in a simulator where the airplane will buff it real hard and the nose will fall through, but you can't get a simulator to go upside down and, and give you the full simulation of spinning upside down. I'm here to tell you, my friends, it's a real eye opener. It's a real eye opener. When all you see is grass down straight down and the airplane is spinning like this and you have to let go and then push that opposite rudder and then wait for, you know, the airplane to stop spinning. It takes a couple of three revolutions. One, two, three, and then you grab the stick again and you pull out. So you're going to lose a few thousand feet. These guys got in such a tight spin or a tight stall that they couldn't recover even though they had 15,000 feet. So we know what happened. We don't know how it happened. The strangest functional check flight I ever had was in a, a King Air uh, for the Navy. And uh, I had, it was a, an extensive one because they had done extensive maintenance to this airplane. It was a complete overhaul, complete repaint of the airplane. They had taken the wings off. They already placed the landing gear, everything. They had replaced everything on this airplane. I went out, I checked it over for about an hour. We went airborne and we're rolling down the runway and we rotate and the airplane starts turning to the right. So I start putting in left aileron. Then I put in a little bit of left rudder. Now I put in more left aileron. The airplane's still turning to the right. I'm like, something's not right here. More left aileron, more left rudder. And finally, I finally arrested the stop and we got, we never got back to completely level flight, but I'm, I got complete aileron in and almost all of the rudder in. And I thought this is, something's definitely wrong with this aircraft. So I got the airplane to kind of come back around. We came Came to a full stop. I taxied it back into the, the hangar and I, I said to the guys, the maintenance guys, I said, there's something seriously wrong with this airplane. I couldn't get it to stop turning to the right, even though I had almost full aileron in. And he said, well, let's take a look at it. So we walked out in front of the airplane and you could see the wings, right? You're looking at the front of the airplane and the wings are like this. They're like cockeyed. I'm like, what? Like, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It's like cockeyed wings. Okay. And so I, I said to him, I said, do you see what I see? And he goes, oh, yeah, the wings are kind of crooked. I go, oh, did they take the wings off? And he goes, yeah, they, oh, this, this maintenance thing they did, they took the wings off. And I go, well, how did they put them back on? I said, don't they have some sort of like a, a, a laser beam or some sort of, you know, instrument that they level the wings with? And he says, he said this to me. I'll never forget these words. He said, no, they just kind of try to line it up to the old paint marks on the outside of the fuselage. Now, some of you didn't want to hear that just now, but I'm here to tell you that that's, that's just the truth. That's the way they did it. And we went over, looked at the airplane, and sure enough, the paint marks were here and the wings were here. So they went out, took the wings off, put them back on. The airplane was fine. I did not take that airplane up again. So the recap on this one is that the Hawker jet did not recover from the stall that was induced. We know what happened. We don't know how it happened. Perhaps when the preliminary report comes out, we'll know a little bit more about how they got into um, this stall that they could not recover from. It was outside Lansing, Michigan. All three on board were fatally injured. Well, now you know. I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe.